This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, brought to you by the Van der Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. If you like us, please join our community of supporters by giving to our Patreon campaign. You'll find all about it on our homepage. I'm your host, Gerard Halpern. And I'm your co-hostess, Dahlia Shenlin, back from a short hiatus. Every week we talk about books and research and other things that we find important. Our guest today is Seth Anziska. He is the Mohammed S. Farsi Polanski Lecturer in Jewish-Muslim Relations at University College London and a visiting fellow at the U.S. Middle East Project. His first book is the much-acclaimed Preventing Palestine, A Political History from Camp David to Oslo. It's been recently published by Princeton University Press, and we're very excited to talk about it today. Seth Anziska, hello and welcome to the show. Hi, it's great to be here. Let's take a broad overview as a first question. Who is Preventing Palestine? All these years. Well, the book is trying to explain the contingent and multidimensional ways in which Palestinian sovereignty is prevented through multiple actors. So it's a story that's about, obviously, Israelis in the way that they envision or imagine Palestinian self-determination, but also a story about the Americans, the Egyptians, and the PLO itself. And what I try to do in the book is explain, both through the political and diplomatic realm, how Palestinian sovereignty is prevented Uh, in the late 1970s, at the very moment when it's first appearing on the international stage as a possible issue to be dealt with in diplomatic circles. But then also, as I look at in the second half of the book, the turn from those political and diplomatic efforts towards the military intervention in Lebanon and how the efforts to sideline the PLO through the war in, in Beirut in particular link up with these earlier efforts in the late 1970s. So I think the question that arises is, When you give it the name Preventing Palestine, it sounds like one of two options. Like there is a concerted effort of somebody's design to make sure this doesn't happen. And in many ways, in reading the book, it often seems to be Israel. It sounds like there's a lot of effort by subsequent Israeli governments and and even explicit red lines, especially during the Begin years, that there will not be a Palestinian state. And maybe supporting actors, right? The Americans and the other Arab countries. How do you characterize these efforts? Do you think that it's really just a confluence of political developments as you write towards the end? Or would you say there are actors that really were by design out to prevent this from the beginning? Well, the argument of the book is one that, as a historian, I have to be very careful, isn't a story of just premeditation or a story of path dependency. Uh, What I'm trying to explain is how particular phenomenon, whether it's political suppression or settlement expansion or this military intervention, combine and lead to this phenomenon of state prevention. Of course, what we think about or what we imagine as a Palestinian state today is not what was conceivable in the late 1970s. So that is a kind of crucial way to start thinking about where this comes from. When the Palestinian quest for self-determination is first being taken seriously in the 1970s, it isn't a question that's being taken seriously as a question of statehood. It's a question that's being taken seriously as a question of self-determination or a question of how to enable certain political rights for the people who live in the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. What I try to explain is how those elements come together in the late 1970s because of certain crucial dynamics. And here in Israel, this dynamic that I think is most central is the rise of Menachem Begin and the Likud party to power, which bring a prime minister who looks at Palestinian sovereignty in a totally different way than what had come before and who is very keen on avoiding the possibility of a sovereign outcome for Palestinians. It happens at the very moment when in the United States you have a U.S. president who's for the first time actually speaking openly about Palestinian rights and about the idea of a homeland. Was it really a watershed? Because the prime ministers, the labor prime ministers who preceded Begin didn't really talk about Palestinian statehood or even, you know, when they were talking about land for peace, they were talking about giving the West Bank back to Jordan rather than ensuring some sort of Palestinian sovereignty. And I want to take it one step further and ask you this. I mean, the big novelty of your book is that it looks at Palestinian self-determination. It takes some sort of long view approach to it. I mean, we, we're all used to talking about it starting from the Madrid conference and the Oslo Accords in the early 1990s, but you're looking at how the concept evolved in the 1970s and the 1980s. But there's a big distinction there, especially that that 
that I, I would like to suss out here is that the late 1980s and early 1990s were a watershed moment because the concept of Palestinian self-determination changed radically and from some sort of autonomy that we're not sure whether it's gone is it was just lip service we're going to get to that in a second but this amorphous concept of self-determination transformed into something that is more perhaps not statehood but something that is more based on self-rule so my question to you is perhaps a devil's advocate question. What the, is the your means, question? <laughs> that is, we didn't talk about Palestinian self-determination in the 1970s and the 1980s because it didn't really mean much. Well, there I would actually disagree because the, the suggestion here is that it is in the 1970s in particular where PLO political claims are being made in status terms and are being made in political terms. And this has to do with a broader history of Palestinian political evolution, the work of Yazid Sayel, for example, or Mohammed Musleh, who both look at how this evolution takes place, where the PLO moves towards a partition model or a two-state model. This is something that's happening in the 1970s. And it's because of the conjunction of that transformation and the rise of Carter and the beginning of a discourse on human rights and self-determination in American foreign policy that you actually see in alignment with a new way of thinking about the Palestinians. Remember, when Carter speaks about a Palestinian homeland, this is shocking to the American public. It's shocking to Cold War conservatives. It's shocking to American Jews because that concept hadn't been thought about or talked about in reference to Palestinians. There were origins and roots of this in the earlier 1970s where, for example, at the Brookings Institution in Washington, a whole host of centrist, left-wing, and right-wing policymakers had come together to talk about the idea of Palestinian political rights. So it was very much in the air, we might say, in the 1970s, and it's this constellation that makes it real. Now, transformations then happen in the 1980s, and we can talk about why there's a delayed recognition of the PLO, why the PLO itself only is, is embracing some of the international uh, texts around the question of self-determination in the late 1980s, but I think this is first emerging in the 70s. I think it's a very interesting uh, development on a political science level that if we're talking in the 1970s about an evolving discourse of human rights, an understanding of the need for self-determination for Palestinians, and then an initial concept that the Palestinians are a nation, to me it seems like human rights, self-determination, and national identity equals statehood. But Nobody could conceptualize it at the time. How does it make that shift? Well, that's a really important point, is that there's a nebulous way in which self-determination or human rights is or is not equated with a statist outcome. And that's one of the big arguments here of the book, is to be very careful that when we say that statehood is prevented, it's a process that has a certain outcome. But we, we have to think back historically and understand that in the 70s, that possibility isn't quite developed, because it is about something like an entity with Jordan or some form of limited self-rule. And I'm suggesting that those models that are, in many ways, a lesser form of sovereignty or statehood are the key to understanding why actual sovereignty uh, is prevented because of models like limited autonomy or self-rule that become sort of instantiated in the diplomatic realm and in the political realm in the 70s, what you get by the 80s, what you get by the time in which Madrid and Washington emerge as a result is a concept or a debate over this notion of limited self-rule, of limited autonomy rather than a statist outcome. I mean, I have to just draw the comparison here because I love comparing different conflicts. And this reminds me so much of Kosovo because for so long the Serbs said, oh, we can give them you know, almost in the same words as Begin, will go very far in terms of autonomy. And then you had Resolution 1244, which ended the war and said they can have something that will reflect their self-determination, but it won't exactly be a thing because we're not going to say what that thing is. And ultimately, they're turning into a state and the Palestinians aren't. But I guess the question is, maybe this wasn't just limited to the 1970s, this concept that we can have something less than a state large autonomy, but maybe it just doesn't work. Well, and there's precedent also in Jewish history to think about how autonomous discourse is emerging in the early 20th century, and that's something that Begin himself is drawing on. And the question in the case of Palestine is why is it that this particular issue in international politics, when it emerges as a question oriented around this possibility of self-determination or even political sovereignty doesn't get fulfilled or addressed in the way that other comparable conflicts do get addressed. And this is tied to this question of uh, self-rule and self-determination coming after the age of decolonization. 
So this is why the 70s is so crucial. But it would be, you know, a mistake to only think about it in relationship to these political efforts or the discourse around Palestinian politics. It's also combined, as I'm trying to argue in the book, with physical developments on the ground here in Israel and in uh, the Palestinian territories themselves. The perhaps the one book and the earlier book and of the book is the uh, Camp David Accords between uh, Israel and Egypt. That actually, surprisingly, I mean it's well known, but it surprises me each time anew that after the preamble in the actual accord itself, even before they discuss Israeli-Egyptian relations, there's a big chunk dedicated to Palestinian autonomy. Now, hearing what you say about the concept and how it it was imbued with meaning despite the amorphousness of it, etc., we can argue that it was just an opening to a larger process that would have led towards greater Palestinian self-determination. What I'm saying is there was no pressure on either side to include it, yet they chose to do it. What do you think was behind the inclusion of Palestinian autonomy well, in that accord? Well, there was pressure in the sense that in 1977, after Carter is elected, he and his leading advisors in the State Department and the National Security Council come up with very detailed plans for a comprehensive vision of Middle East peace with the Palestine question at the center. And we have from declassified documents, we have evidence of maps, of borders that were drawn, of the status of Jerusalem, of the right of return being on the table. And this could be considered a kind of early iteration of the idea that emerges as the two-state solution. Certainly, it's articulated in a different key, and it's talked about in refer- reference to self, to an entity linked with Jordan. It's not quite the idea of a state. But what I suggest is that the basis of sovereignty is present in that idea. When Begin comes into office, and this goes back to the earlier point, he fundamentally rejects the idea of dealing with the Palestinians in political terms. This has always been a consistent view, and we can think back actually to Begin's remarks in the Israeli cabinet in 1967 when he's brought on in the unity government when Eshkol is trying to sort of explore options of what to do with the newly conquered territories. Begin is adamantly opposed to any form of autonomy or self-rule or political rights for the Palestinians who are living there, uh, unlike other uh, potential options that had emerged, whether it's the Alone Plan or Diane's views, which were in some ways more akin to a more meaningful sovereignty. Begin's position evolves somewhat by the time he becomes a prime minister, but he still takes this model of autonomy from earlier 20th century ideas, and he looks at the Palestinians not as a people, not as a collective, not as Palestinians. He calls them uh, Arab residents of Judea and Samaria. And he sees which them... Is, which is not that different from what they're called now yeah. by people who agree with Begin's perspective yeah, or further right. And we can talk about the through line between Begin and the revival of those ideas today. But he looks at the Palestinians as a national minority to be dealt with in benevolent terms. And this is where I think you see a kind of appreciation or revival of Begin as a a liberal. And I think that's something that needs to be interrogated. But he looks back at these interwar European models and he says we can, as Zionists, have a benevolent attitude towards these local Arabs by providing them with some form of limited self-rule. But, and this is where the Camp David Accords comes in, the suggestion that this might lead to statehood or sovereignty is out of the question. And it's through the negotiations over the Camp David process and through Sadat and Begin's decision to move towards a bilateral peace that we have clear red lines established. Returning the Sinai is a possibility. Returning the West Bank and the Gaza Strip is not. Why was Begin doing it? I mean, there's so many other instances in the history of uh, Israeli-American relations of an Israeli prime minister saying to a um, U.S. president, no, this is clearly out of off the table, out of the question. Why uh, didn't Begin just say the same to Carter? I mean, he could have said to Carter, if unless there's no mention of the Palestinians in the accord, I'm not signing this bilateral agreement with Sadat. And I'm assuming that Carter, being so keen on promoting peace in the Middle East, any kind of peace in the Middle East, would say, okay, forget the Palestinians for now, let's concentrate on Egypt. But, but if I can just add to that question, which is sort of a question to you, Gilad, I mean, I, I think that we may be, my question to you, Seth, is that should we be remembering that this is only 10 years after the war, the idea of these territories is new, the idea of controlling what at that time was just over 2 million people, close to 3 million people, was still new and people were still not sure what to do. I mean, I don't think Begin was in denial that there is an issue to be resolved. He didn't say we can't talk about the Palestinians. He said it has to be something that's not statehood. 
what do you think of my theoretical answer to Gilad's question? This is why the autonomy model is actually on Begin's mind and is, in his view, how he's thinking about this Palestinian component of the Camp David Accords themselves. Nowhere in the text, if you read it, is it talking about self-determination. That's excluded from the text itself. There's a general, non-binding invocation of a broader comprehensive regional peace that will include the Palestinians somehow. That is not explicitly detailed. And in many ways, this is partially also Sadat's failure. Because Anwar al-Sadat, when he talked openly about defending Palestinian interests or thinking about the Palestinian question, he was seen as somebody who was supposed to go to bat for them. And this is a broader uh, comment on inter-Arab politics as it relates to the Palestinians. But in effect, because of Cold War pressures, his desire after the 1973 war, which in many ways he foments and begins as a means of breaking the stranglehold of detente, he wants to get the return of Egyptian territory, and he's willing to do that at the expense of a resolution to the Palestinians. So at the end of the day, it wasn't quite preventing Palestine. It was quite the opposite, because out of the two options that Begin could have conceded to, either not discussing Palestine at all, or agreeing to a rather limited self-determinations, uh, limited sovereignty, the three parties, Begin, Carter and Sadat, opted for the better solution, didn't they? Well, they... Was it an option not to talk about it at all? No, because they deferred the conversation about Palestine and the Palestinians to a series of meetings over autonomy, which took place between 1979 and 1982 in the wake of the signing of the bilateral No, but what piece. I'm saying is autonomy is the best they could have come up with but at you're, the time. But you're assuming that there was an option to do this whole negotiation without ever mentioning the Palestinians, and I'm not sure I'm asking you. No, no, no. I'm, so, I'm talking about the other extreme of saying, okay, you know, let's discuss Palestinian sovereignty in earnest without just, you know, some sort of... Nobody could conceptualize it at the time, I think, is the argument. Well, they were talking about it in different ways, particularly in the United States and in Egypt. What I'm suggesting is that the Begin government and the Israelis in particular didn't actually want to talk about it in sovereign terms. So you can put it in the text, you can address it in the meetings and the conversations, but in actual, real... Uh, policy terms or political terms, this is something that can be shunted to the side through these autonomy negotiations. So all things considered, wouldn't you say that it was, in a way, enabling Palestine no less than preventing Palestine? then you would have to explain how it enables it, because the whole argument here is that those autonomy talks which emerge directly from Camp David are actually premised on Begin's view of a very limited autonomy, of an autonomy not designed to lead to self-determination. But, but this, I, think, no, I think we're conflating, I think we're conflating advancing, you know, theoretically, in the minds of Begin, advancing the issue of the Palestinians with the idea of giving them independent state sovereignty, which is two different things. I think from Begin's perspective, sure, we'll, you know, we say in Hebrew, we say, well, you know, we'll come towards them. We'll give them something that they need. But that's very different from saying we're going to create the political infrastructure for independent sovereign statehood. Sure. And we're also going to resolve the dilemma of the Eshkol government of the decision not to decide on the fate of the territories by saying that we remove this issue from the equation because we've addressed in benevolent terms some of the needs of the local residents. And created in some ways what you seem to think of as sort of the original sin underlying the lack of Palestine today, which is the disconnection of autonomy from a territorial component. Precisely. And it's the model of this limited notion of autonomy that is then picked up in the Madrid and Washington talks and eventually confirmed in the Oslo process. And we can in many ways see the basis of the Palestinian Authority today as rooted in the very same ideas that are being discussed in the three years of the autonomy talks between the Egyptians and the Israelis under American supervision. Right, except from the Israeli perspective, the innovation seems to me that Begin created a situation in the minds of at least of the Israeli right wing that the entire Palestinian issue, question, has to do with their rights on a personal level but does not have a territorial component, which is what sort of psychologically and then politically enables as the Israeli right wing to say, let's just keep settling the territory. This isn't a territorial question. Yes. I think that also is explained by his appointment of Yosef Borg as the head of the autonomy negotiations. Who is Yosef Borg? He's the minister of interior. This is not a foreign mm-hmm. policy issue. Mm-hmm. This is an interior issue. And this is a greater land of Israel that encompasses the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. And so the people living there are part of that story. Tell us about uh, Carter. I mean, you have one of the things you do here is look at the figures, you know, the characters who make this drama happen. And in some ways, if the whole book is about preventing Palestine, Carter in some ways comes out to be, you know, the righteous who in many ways really does keep putting the issue back on the agenda, trying to insist, 
that they have their rights on some level. And what does that mean? Well, in the terms of his time, it was, as you point out, kind of radical and difficult for the Jewish community here. Is that a fair characterization that he genuinely wanted Palestinian self-determination on some level? Or would you say ultimately he sold out? I think we have to look at the broader historical context of how self-determination is being dealt with. And lots of historians have reassessed the Carter period to say that the promise or the rhetoric of human rights didn't always meet the reality on the ground. In the case of the Palestinians, I genuinely believe that Carter began to see them slowly but increasingly over time in the same way he understood his own interaction with African Americans growing up in the segregated South. And he understood that the deprivation of rights, that their inability to access and have equality on, in terms of their territorial movement, in terms of their access to land and water and other resources, was a very central issue that needed to be addressed. He also was dealing with other political pressures at the time. So this is not the only agenda on the table. I well, the we like to think we're the only <laughs> agenda on a president's mind. And Ever. we know from the broader domestic context of economic difficulties, but also eventually the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the overthrow of the Shah in Iran and the revolution, all of these things combined to limit the possible outcomes. I think he believed and he wanted very much to address the Palestinian question. I think one of his great frustrations, and in many ways we could explain or understand his entire post-presidential orientation towards the Palestinian issue, his engagement with Hamas, the way in which he thinks and talks about Palestine as an outgrowth of a sense of failure and a sense of um, having lost in this uh, political battle. And there we should give credit in many ways to Begin for pushing through a very particular line, insisting on it, and being consistent throughout. And there was a fundamental misreading, I think, of Begin and Begin's position. And if we had looked closely at what Begin was arguing prior to coming to office and what he was arguing through the Camp David process and all throughout the 1980s, he was nothing if not consistent in his attitude. What's the misreading? View. Well, the misreading is that, for example, the Americans, in this case, Carter thought he had secured a partial settlement freeze in the context of the Camp David Accords. This was not actually secured. We know this from the work of Bill Quant, but also an idea that he would eventually contend or potentially give up on the possibility of retaining the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The thing about Carter, as you spell out in the book clearly, is that he came into office with a very clear vision for the Middle East that had radically been different from his predecessors, namely Kissinger, in terms of seeing it as a whole, as some sort of a comprehensive problem and needed to be addressed as a whole. And at the end of the day, he ended up diffusing the unity of the Arab-Israeli problem by taking Egypt out of the equation and fostering bilateral agreement with Israel. And this is exactly part of the line that was held by the PLO at the time, that was Arafat and the PLO were adamantly opposed to uh, the Camp David Accord, especially for this reason. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, there might be other reasons as well. But do you think that this line was vindicated with time? I mean, were the PLO right all along? In the sense of why they opposed or rejected the Camp David yeah. process? Well, they didn't see that process bringing them in in terms of serious political outcome. They understood, and this is why they resisted endorsing 242, the UN Resolution 242, when there were secret negotiations with the Carter administration, Yasser Arafat and the PLO executive. There was a lot of resistance to the idea because the language, as we know in 242, is somewhat unclear about the extent of what territory would actually be returned, and the Palestinians themselves are not mentioned. So they didn't see this as necessarily leading to statehood. There is an evolution in Palestinian politics. This is not a static organization. This encompasses multiple and very fragmentary uh, factions within the PLO. And over time, and this is why by 1988, we do get an endorsement of 242 and official recognition. But that process is happening alongside so many other things that are also transpiring on the ground and also transpiring in the PLO's own position vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, all these other actors. Also, another interesting thing about your historical perspective is that you tackle three major events in the history of uh, the conflict in the 70s and 80s, that we tend to look at them, at them separately. I'm talking about the Camp David Accords, the Lebanon War, and the First Intifada. For Israel, there were, at least for Israel, there were three different fronts of the conflict, but entirely or almost entirely separated. Yet you see a direct line being drawn between them in the context of Palestinian self-determination. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. I mean, this is, I think, one of the, the core innovations that I'm trying to get across is that we need to rethink our periodization. We need to go way back before the 1990s and stop only thinking about the Palestinian question as a result of Madrid or the Oslo process. We need to think about its roots when it first emerges. And by the way, this is not to say we shouldn't be thinking about, obviously, a much broader context. We could talk about 
British mandatory period, we could talk about 4867. In this instance, in a discrete way of the book, I'm trying to suggest the continuities from the 70s, but also how the political and diplomatic efforts to avoid a political or sovereign outcome for Palestinians is linked in particular in the mind of Ariel Sharon, who's uh, the defense minister on the eve of the Lebanon war, with the attempt to militarily destroy the PLO in Beirut and their stronghold. And it's exactly on the heels of the autonomy talks that that invasion begins, and part of the rationale has to do with a desire to relieve pressure on any withdrawal from the West Bank. And maybe to some extent a bit of a divide-and-rule approach to the Palestinians, like we'll maybe empower some of the locals in the West Bank and Gaza and you know, thereby remove some of the authority of the PLO. Yes, and this is coterminous with other phenomenon that are being suggested, things like the village leagues, which are attempts to do exactly that, to find local, uh, in many ways, quizzling uh, leaders who would be loyal to the Israeli state and to the Israeli occupation, and also things like West Bank mayoral schemes, uh, quality of life initiatives, all of these things are happening at the same time. The Jordan option, so finding ways to work around or avoid contending with the PLO. And why is that central? Because the PLO and its demands are very much at this time oriented towards a political statist outcome. So if you avoid dealing with that, the argument at the time in the Israeli mindset is that you can avoid dealing with the question of Palestinian nationalism. Of course, the outbreak of the First Intifada shows you how wrong that is. That's one of the great ironies of the invasion of Lebanon, is that an attempt to destroy or undermine Palestinian nationalism even with the organized withdrawal of the PLO from Beirut, what do we get? We get the exile, the reorientation of Palestinian politics, the return of dynamics on the ground here in Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip, the rise of unified national command around the first intifada of local Palestinian politics, the rise of Hamas. All of these things in many ways are a response to the dispersal and the exile. Of the but PLO. what they all share, what they all share is that no matter where it's located, no matter who's leading it, no matter what they're doing, whether it's using force or using diplomacy, Palestinian national identity and as a national cause does not go away, just like most other nationalisms don't go away. Why does Israel fail to internalize that each time? I think that's the golden question. I think that's the ongoing question. I think that all the evidence we have from the 70s and 80s is exactly that, that you cannot avoid contending or dealing with the Palestinian question in terms of collective or national demands. Now, I should say that there are other ways in which people have tried to address it in non-status varieties, so not necessarily oriented towards sovereignty over territory. But I think that there has always been a through line, and this goes even before the 70s, of trying to combat, contend, elide the possibility of self-determination. I'm not not sure I agree with what you two have just said. Uh, There is, in a way, of course... They were trying, Begin and the others were trying to keep the lid on a can of worms and, well, of course, unsuccessful. But going back to what you said about Begin's reasoning in including the autonomy in the Camp David Accord, saying that, you know, agreeing to some sort of arrangement that would get it off the table, at least for the foreseeable future, didn't he think that he was opening the floodgates to more discussion of sovereignty that, you know, it starts with a limited autonomy, but... 20 years later, or however many it was, Likud prime minister, namely Benjamin Netanyahu, would recognize the right of the Palestinians to their own state. Did he not think that that would be the end point you of that? You are totally shaking your head. No, because he first of all talked openly about the idea of immigration and absorption of Jews from the diaspora. As His whole hope was resting on the demographic balance. Exactly. And also... He didn't expect or imagine that this would preclude the possibility of Jewish settlement, right? He's always very clear that any autonomy granted towards Palestinians is hand-in-hand with the assertion of Jewish sovereignty through building and through territorial settlement. And this is constantly asserted and argued throughout. So if there's a way to manage the rest of the population, if there's a way to grant them some limited rights, that doesn't mean that this is going to lead to a status claim. I want to ask you about your book from a reverse perspective. What if we had called your book Preventing Peace for Israel, Preventing Security for Israel? I mean, at every stage along the way, you could also give an alternate reading of all of the phases you write about, and many of them are included in your book, right? The ongoing terror attacks, uh, the Palestinian rejection of 242 for many years before 1988. Is this a book that is oriented towards singling out Israel and other actors, not only Israel, as the main reasons? I mean... Could we shift the lens and say there's a whole other reading of this in which really the Palestinians bear a lot of the responsibility for preventing their own Palestine? Their well, mistakes, misjudgments, uh, maybe some would say ill intent. 
I mean, this is the core material of any historian's uh, way of writing or thinking about their topic is how do we understand agency and how do we understand contingency? What I try to suggest is it's uh, multidirectional. There's lots of things happening. But in many ways, because of their exclusion from the political process that I'm talking about, Palestinian agency in that actual prevention is in many ways marginal to what the Israelis, the Americans, and the Egyptians are doing. We could tell a very different story if we only looked at grassroots activists or if we looked at a ground-up story. I try here in in the international approach I take to combine state actors, non-state actors uh, from a host of perspectives, but there are other ways in which things could have turned out. Uh, The argument is not to say that Palestine was irretrievably prevented or that other outcomes couldn't have happened. It's that if we look in total at the way in which this process unfolded, this is what we get. What does it say about peacemaking today? I mean, understanding the way the concept was perceived in the 70s and 80s. How do you think it could inform policymakers? Yeah, what are the big mistakes that were made that we could try to avoid now and maybe do better? Well, first, we're, I think one of the big mistakes is we obsessively only think about the 1990s. We only consider the legacy of Oslo and we think that the origins of these problems are a story of uh, the failures of Oslo. And here I'm suggesting that the the framing or the ideas or the concepts that uh, go into it 15 years earlier are crucial. And this is why when I hear Naftali Bennett, for example, talking about imposing autonomy on steroids for Palestinians or partial annexation of Area C, I hear the voice of Begin coming through very clearly. Because Except that he's dropped a million from even Begin's demographic understanding of, of the Palestinians, who Begin was saying three million, Naftali Bennett is saying two million. I, and it's and hard he to also, take... also dropped the liberalism from his right. understanding. <laughs> Yeah, but we should also be careful not to only pin this on the right. I mean, if we look at the center and even the center left, there's a similar dynamic that thinks you can avoid the possibility of dealing with claims of sovereignty or self-determination. So you may say that we don't know if this is going to lead to a two-state outcome or something else, but in some ways, those questions are a red herring. It's the very principle or the very assertion of rights, that Palestinians have rights, that they have collective and individual rights, and that those rights need to be respected and engaged with and taken seriously by the Israeli government that I think has not been learned. I understand. I just want to go back to one last point. I know we have to finish up, but when you say that the Palestinians were marginalized from the process and therefore had limited influence, Absolutely correct. Of course, your research shows it from the negotiating perspective and the official perspective. But I think that, again, the voice, what animates so much of the Israeli right today, and not just the Israeli right, is the sense that there was an original sin on the Palestinians' part of using violence. And, you know, Begin was able to say Arafat is a little Hitler and we have to, you know, and even to this day, you see the conversations on Facebook and people are saying, why should we allow anything for the people who want to destroy us? Do you think that this was just, you know, tactically terrible choice of the Palestinians in the earliest stages of their struggle to use violence that cannot be wiped out from the Israeli consciousness. And, you know, that they do have sort of an influence over the process because they loom so large in the minds of Begin. Could I turn the question back and say, shouldn't we think about the elements of violence at the core of the Zionist movement? Absolutely. Or any national movement. Any national movement. So why are we surprised? I think that's really the question. We can condemn, we can think it's horrible, we can have ethical questions about the use of violence and about tactics, but there's nothing surprising about the ways in which this kind of conflict unfolds given the denial of rights, given the quest for self-determination. We would see it in the Zionist case, we shouldn't be surprised we see it in the Palestinian case. And therefore, I would say we also have to say that if we see it in every, in many other nationalist struggles, violence is used and then ultimately achieves the goal of eventually leading to national liberation, which is maybe you can say the Palestinians are the one case where it hasn't, or one of the few where it hasn't led to. Well, al Karim is what I have to say. I do think that's why we're also entering a stage where Palestinians are often rethinking the question of what the national project looks like. It might not be tied to a state. And this is a discourse that is shifting internally in Palestinian politics and also in the Palestinian diaspora, but orienting towards something that's rights-based or something that's not oriented around territorial sovereignty alone. Because if we look, of course, at the map of the West Bank and what's happened there, it's very hard to imagine or to see how contiguous sovereignty could be achieved. Well, time will tell. And until then, I would like to thank you, Dr. Seth Ziska, for joining us today. You're the Mohammed S. Farsi Polonsky Lecturer in Jewish-Muslim Relations at University College London and a visiting fellow at the U.S. Middle East Project. Thank you for coming in and discussing your new book, Preventing Palestine, A Political History from Camp David to Oslo. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. And also thanks to Gizem Ozdemir, our sound engineer, and to Itai Shalem, our producer, and the Van Leer Institute for their generous support. And now we 
we've got a request. Many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app and we have a special request for you. Please consider writing us a review. Just launch the app, select our podcast in the library section, scroll down to ratings and review and press write a review and then of course write one. You can also support us by going to our website, that's tlv1.fm slash review and subscribing on to our Patreon campaign. We've got gifts for you and other stuff as well. Check out our archive with almost 500 interviews. If you like what we do here, like us on Facebook. Our page is called the Tel Aviv Review Podcast, Ideas from Israel. And don't forget to follow me and Dalia on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from Dalia and from me, goodbye. Goodbye.